always truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. All right. Welcome back, folks. Greatest podcast ever. And uh, we have a repeat offender on from National Review, David Harsanyi. David, thanks for being on. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is your uh, third appearance on the podcast, uh, probably because you got a lot of smart things to say. So uh, I, I do some <laughs> great writing and some great research. So I appreciate what you do. Um, you've got a uh, book out called Euro Trash, and uh, it, it was it's it's really good. It's got it's it's packed with data. Um, it's it really is worth looking into for anybody who wants to refute these arguments that are that are persistently heard on the left and i think what you point out in this book is um it seems like the american left is is has created a caricature of what europe really is both the good and the bad um it's like they 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 don't want to acknowledge some of the things that republicans would like to uh acknowledge uh, and they, they want to, to, to build out, um, some kind of idealistic dreamlike version of, of all the bad things. And so you just lay it all out on every subject, uh, bit by bit. I mean, what, why did you, why did you even want to write this book? Huh? Well, I, I know that, you know, um, so the elites in the United States for a long time, cultural elites for sure have always, uh, praised Europe and looked towards Europe, even between the world wars, even after the world war to and et cetera. But I, I noticed not that I was around then, but I've noticed in recent years, uh, you just see an expanding number of people, the Paul Krugman's of the world, uh, but basically all progressives, uh, turning to Europe for our, you know, to solve our problems or asking us to do that. And I just, I went, I decided to take a deep dive on a bunch of different topics in the book and debunk or not uh, their contentions about how things are better over there. And uh, in most quantifiable ways, it's simply not true that they are better. I don't think it's not to say we're perfect. We're surely not. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand that before we start, you know, embracing their ideas. So I figured I'd, I, I, you know, take a really deep dive in, in there and, and lay out what things they do better and what things they don't. And there's a number of things, um, trying to think in my head, which ones I want to start on. Maybe let's start with the free speech stuff. And uh, we, there's a, what was the, um, I think it's called the newsroom. It was this, uh, maybe like a Showtime show or, or something. And I think Jeff Daniels was the main character. And uh, it's, the, I think the first episode goes into this tirade as a supposedly Republican news anchor about how America's really not free, that free or, or that great compared to, to other nations. He lists this long list of countries that, well, you know, Belgium is free, France is free, Germany is free. And this is, I, I think, taken at face value by most Americans. But um, the truth is they don't have a Bill of Rights. They, they, they don't even appear to perceive freedom the way that we perceive freedom. Uh, as you know, they, their Bill of Rights is more like a list of services that citizens are owed. So maybe speak to the philosophical differences in how Americans view freedom and rights uh, even though we got those ideas from Europe, um, to be sure, uh, but how they don't really uh, abide by those ideals anymore and how that affects laws like, I mean, you note that every year thousands of Germans are, are arrested or fined for, you know, speech infringements. Right. But I think that the most important part of that is that we actually take those uh we actually take those rights seriously where I think it was uh, Judge Scalia said um, that everyone's got a constitution. Basically, everyone has something that resembles the Bill of Rights, but very few people take them it seriously. Right. So we do. I think that's a major difference. The other, of course, is it weirdly intertwines with faith, at least for, in my opinion, in the sense that people who believe in God generally believe there are things bigger than themselves. So it's easier for them to accept the fact that rights are handed down to you from something from God or something bigger than government and the state. Whereas I think Europeans have always, or for a very long time, looked to the state as a, the law giver, you know, and things like that. So, so, so they're much more, um, inclined to much more, uh, pliable, much more inclined to listen to the state when it tells them what they can and can't do. 
Um, there is another aspect to this. Americans are unruly in, in, in ways of freedom in the sense that um, – they don't because they don't view rights as as given by the state. They they're they're not inclined to uh, easily adopt changes <laughs> to founding documents and things like that. Where the European Union Constitution, for instance, has hundreds of thousands of addendum and and all of this. So it's just confusing. I think the simple nature of the Constitution uh, is is very beneficial because we take those things seriously and it's not always expanded on. And then thirdly, I just wanted to quickly say, I think there's another aspect to this, which Orwell actually wrote about. Everyone always talks about Orwellian, uh, and they think about the state telling you what you can say and words being, you know, euphemistic words and all that. But he also wrote in the intro to animal farm once about the most, a corrosive kind of censorship is self-censorship. It's it's when society won't talk, speak the truth because they're scared to offend or because they just simply take it on themselves to censor themselves in ways they shouldn't. And I think that's a huge problem in Europe where you don't have the sort of ideological arguments you have here. You have sort of a center right and center left, but ideologically they're basically in the same, you know, on the same side sort of debating policy issues, not actually debating underlying ideological issues as we do here quite often, which makes it very, um, which doesn't make the debate as important, I think, as, as it does here in Western Europe, at least these days. Now, I mean, so you read about Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. It says, the exercise of these freedoms, since it carries with it duties and responsibilities. So far, I like this. I, I, I talk about this often because I'm not a libertarian. Uh, and, and I do think that citizens owe some kind of duty and responsibility to living as good citizens and have freedoms. Like it so far. Then it's, uh, it goes on. Maybe subject to such formalities, conditions, restrictions, or penalties as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society. Again, it, that makes sense. Okay. What kind of restrictions and formalities, uh, I wonder? It says, but in the interest of national security. Okay. Territorial disorder of crime. Okay. For the protection of health and morals. Okay. That seems a little... Now, now we're getting now we're getting into some interesting territory. I'm not sure how you define these things. And it goes on for the protection of the reputation of rights of others. OK, that sounds like a that sounds like a hurt feelings chit that you can uh, that you can that you can fill out and send to the government and get somebody arrested. This is not good. This is going down a dark path. Oh, what else does it say? And for preventing the disclosure of information received in confidence. It's like what? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, or for maintaining the authority and impartiality of the judiciary. Well, that makes sense. Um, OK, and you say Article 10 is worse than useless, in fact, because it creates the false sense that a legitimate enduring liberty can exist in Europe under these malleable notions. So, I mean, expand on this. And again, this gets to the they, they see rights differently. They, they, they really do. Um, it's like try, try to explain the Second Amendment to someone in Europe. They just cannot comprehend. They can't. It. Right. They, right. they cannot get it. <laughs> it's, they hate it's the same it. thing with the First Amendment. I mean, they'll tell you that there's a common good and that you shouldn't. And you hear a lot of this on the left, frankly. I mean. I know it in the book. I mean, there was, you know, the New York Times runs 8,000 word essays in their magazine, uh, basically saying that that the First Amendment's an antiquated idea because there's uh, false news and misinformation, all that stuff, as if those things don't exist in Europe, right? So, um, in essence, it's a mission creep to control speech. And we have, for the most part, we've a couple of times in our history, or more than a couple of times, things that, you know, We've taken a step back on that front, but in general, that was one right we could all respect, right? In 1968 in Berkeley, the hippies were were fighting. They had, you know, it was a free speech zone and things like that. You know, simply because you were offended by speech, it didn't mean that you know we'd have a law. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have hate speech laws or whatever, but now you, you know, the ACLU defended Nazis in Skokie, you know, all that stuff. Um, but now you don't, you have this divide where you have, I think, progressive left, especially acting like Europeans, where they think that a right, that, uh, that this right is no, because I think they don't believe that it was handed to us by anything bigger than the state. They think that they can change it. And this is, I think, very European in conception and, and, and dangerous. Okay. So, even if somebody agrees with what I just read is, uh, in this Article 10, um, and, and they're, they're open to, to this sort of extra authority given to governments, how would you explain then how it manifests into reality? What kind of laws actually get passed and how are these things enforced in European countries when it comes to free speech? Well, I'll give you an example. In London, quite often, there'll be someone preaching the Bible in a park and he will you know, he will accentuate some parts of the Bible that maybe liberals don't like, and someone will complain and the police will come and shut him down or arrest him. 
this has happened more, you know, this has happened dozens of times, I think. Or in Germany, as I write, you know, people online, so, so a lot of this is happening online now, you know, they'll, they'll really mock in really ugly ways, leadership, prime minister, whatever, and uh, police will show up at their door and either find them or arrest them. This is not something, you know, this happens. The local police in Munich, for instance, will do that. Um, in France, you, you, everyone here, listen, I, I am very sympathetic to um, complaints about tech companies, uh, uh, you know, b banning and censoring voices that they don't like and ideas they don't like. But when you give control to the state of, of these things, as they do in Europe, in, in essence, uh, where well, you have this cronyism, it's not like the state's going to say, okay, let's have more open, you know, discourse here. In essence, they start shutting down speech, which is what they do in Germany and France and elsewhere. So it, it happens on a, on a micro level in the street, but it also happens where tech companies are um, persuaded <laughs> through regula regulation and, and fines to uh, shut down speech that they don't like. So I, I don't have a good solution for that here, but I know that, that, that Europe shows us that the state being in charge of that is no solution at all. Yeah, you also write that French empowers judges to determine the veracity of news and they can order media to take down certain fake news within within hours. Yeah, there's another law in Germany where uh, I think it's France as well, maybe where uh, you can go on. If if you were a politician 20 years ago and you said did something terrible, you can go on. And after a certain amount of time, you can ask Google to remove those stories and they have to do it from the news, which, of course, is uh, is censor is a weird sort of censorship. But censorship it is. Let's talk um, health care. So that's a uh, subject I, I dive into pretty often. And, and you did a, a really thorough look at healthcare in Europe. I and mean, this is this is by far the number one thing that everybody on the left likes to point to. Look, other countries can do it. And I guess the short answer is, of course, you can do it. Uh, but you also have to acknowledge the trade-offs associated with that can-do attitude. And uh, the trade-offs might not be what you think. So um, where do we begin? You, you, you went into a lot about life expectancy and the infant mortality rate. You have some really great points on this. I think it's important for people to know because these are the two metrics that everybody on the left uses to insinuate that that uh, the American healthcare system is, is bonkers, doesn't work. We pay more, we get less. But is that really true once you kind of pick apart the data? Well, it should be noted that the the healthcare systems in Europe, many of them are excellent. I mean, compared to the rest of the world, the, the point is, uh, a lot of the the things that the left wants here, when they talk about longe longevity or infant child mortality rates, things of that nature, they're 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 not giving us the whole story. It's not because of their delivery system that those numbers are skewed. Yes, Europeans typically live a few years longer than Americans, but it's not because of better health care. It's because we live different lives here. For instance, we drive a lot more than than Europeans, a lot more than most uh, Europeans, and we have more vehicular deaths, and that's part of it. Uh, one of the things we don't do as well is gun violence. Obviously, it's a trade-off that that happens with the right to, 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 to have guns in this country, and we have higher homicide rates in cities. So these things affect that rate uh, far more than anything having to do with health care. The sec infant child mortality rates, are, you know, you have countries measure these things differently quite often. Um, and we here in the United States, and I think it's a testament to how we care more about life, frankly, or that we treat it more preciously, is that we try to save every pre premature baby, no matter even if it's a hopeless cause. And those are counted in the statistics. So it skews it a bit in the end. And we also, you know, we have lots of immigrants coming in here and we have, um, you know, that come from bad, health, you know, bad backgrounds of healthcare, not as, as good, but second generation, the numbers change completely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so if you, if you actually, if somebody was really curious about how healthcare outcomes are associated with healthcare delivery, they would, they would look at other studies, studies that might follow somebody after say a, a cancer, uh, diagnosis. So what do we find there? Exactly. We don't have it right in front of me, but we excel. We're better than Europe on almost every on all recovery uh, post breast cancer, things like that. Uh, we, Americans live longer. And also, once they hit a certain age, Americans live longer as well. So it's, it's you know, I, I have it all laid out in the book. I don't remember all the stats, but you can by almost every there's, kind there's of a cancer. good stat. And I kind of want to find it. You, you did 
was obviously I'm asking about that for a reason because I read through it and I have notes here. Okay, here, here it is. It, it wasn't necessarily cancer specifically, but um, among severely ill patients who have been admitted to a hospital, uh, patients in an NHS hospital, which is the British hospital system, four times more likely to die than in a U.S. hospital. Uh, among severely ill patients, the disparity is even worse. Sicker patients were seven times more likely to die in a British hospital than a U.S. hospital. So, I mean, that, that obviously gets more at the issue. It's worth noting, too, you point out, um, yeah, we pay more for drugs, almost twice as much for drugs because they have price controls. We also have access to a lot more drugs. Uh, specifically, cancer drugs brought to the market between 2011 and 2018, only 74% were available in the UK, 8% in Greece. Uh, I've seen a lot of studies on this uh, just uh, across a wide variety of drugs. It's usually around 50%. So they, it, whether it's Canada, UK, Australia, whatever it is, and uh, they, they have access to less drugs, the cutting edge stuff. And so we, we pay more. We do get a bit more for that, too. Um, and so, you know, we got to ask ourselves what, what, what kind of trade offs we want there. Uh, what else should we know about the healthcare system? Well, it's true. We do. You know, it's expensive. Obviously, people feel that. Um, and I'm not a champion of how the American system is set up right now. I, I would like more free mar free market solutions or more open markets so that state. Yeah. A lot it's of not, times it's not well are basically <laughs> monopolies, right? So, yeah monopolized by one company. Um, when I lived in Colorado, for instance, I basically had one choice. This isn't the way it should be in this country. Um, and I'm not saying that the European system and, and you know, obviously uh, countries have different systems. There are, are, are terrible far yeah. from it. Considering what, 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 what's, what's a good one. What, what's maybe a better example that we might look to in Europe. Um, I've, I've seen the Swiss model, uh, it seems kind of the closest thing that America might, might want to replicate if we were to replicate anything, but I could be wrong. It's funny because no matter what what I say, whenever someone asks me whatever topic it is, what who does it right in Europe, it's always like the Swiss is usually the answer. I think the Swiss do a pretty good job at almost everything. Um, but obviously, it's a small country and scaling that sort of system, you know, has its own problems, which is usually happens. But I mean, I think the British system would, where, you know, the system that, you know, they just worship, worship the healthcare system there. <laughs> they treat it as if it's a church. You know, people are are constantly on long lines waiting for basic surgeries, waiting for drugs. It's, you know, people have very easy access, but once, just because you have access doesn't mean you're getting the best care. And I think it's important to remember that. I think Americans do get access and they do get very high levels of care here. Yeah. And, and maybe, I, I, maybe I would refine that point and say just because you have a right to health care doesn't mean you have access. Because right. as you state here, a report from April 2019 said more than 220,000 people have been waiting more than six months to receive medical treatment. They triage this stuff. And, and this, is, this is, in fact, what will always happen if you implement price controls. They pay their doctors less. They pay their nurses less. You, you note that many nurses go quit and will prefer to work as uh, grocery store clerks. <laughs> just because that that seems to pay more that's insane and um and so it, it stands to reason that you're going to have less of these things if you're not paying well enough uh, if there's no profit incentive and if there's less of the stuff then people have less access to the stuff and the stuff in this case is healthcare. absolutely yeah so, so you know there, there's a wide variety of systems being used there i think like you know i prefer the french system to the english system right i mean I, you know so things like that but so I, I just make general points about because typically we're talking about socialized medicine as it's practice in Britain is what Bernie wants to bring here in the end. Right. So um, so basically I focus on 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 Britain on more than any other system. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be Britain and Europe to me or sorry, Canada to me or the seem like the things the Democrats want to want to bring here the most. Uh, let's talk about the Nordic countries, uh, the Nordic Utopias, chapter two. Look, there's a lot of good things about the Nordic countries that maybe we should copy. Uh, there's a lot of bad things, too. What, what does the left get wrong and uh, wrong about both sides of that argument? Well, it's it's a weird it's weird to argue this, but the truth is that they actually um, treat those countries as socialist paradises, but they're not. They're quite capitalistic in many ways. It's a it's it's a very uh, open, free market, capitalistic system propping up a welfare state, and you know. They want the welfare state part, which, again, you're talking about small countries. I think Sweden has nine million people scaling that for 350 million people creates a massive bureaucracy um, that 
and that massive bureaucracy scares me more than most things in America, because as we've seen during COVID, you know, the CDC can run the country or it thinks it can, <laughs> you know, can you imagine expanding that bureaucracy tenfold, 20 fold, um, or the state department decides the president doesn't like the president's policies and simply undermines them. I don't care who the president is. I mean, this is, so for me, these giant bureaucracies are quite scary. And in Europe, you know, there isn't much people won't speak up too much, but they run the nations basically. So, but the, but the problem is that the left here, they don't want, they don't want to pay for it, right? Like in, in, in Denmark or in Sweden, people pay 65% of their, you know, salaries and taxes off the, off the bat. And it's not just the rich, it's everyone. It's the poor, it's the middle class. Everyone pays really high levels of taxes. They pay value added taxes, you know, consumption taxes, and, uh, they pay for it. And they have the kind of, society where it works, where, where everyone's very similar, <laughs> have similar thoughts, have similar habits, uh, have high levels of societal trust, trust in institutions, things like that, that we don't have and we shouldn't have. Um, and that's, you know, what, that's what they get wrong. That's why it wouldn't work here. I don't think. Yeah. And they're not, they're not progressive at all. Their tax system. I mean, the, the fact that a large portion of their taxes is a VAT, which is effectively a consumption tax. I mean, if you ask a lot of more libertarian, right-leaning econo economists that they, they would say, look, I just want a flat tax, consumption tax. It's by far the most efficient way to tax the population and fund the government. There's a lot of good arguments to that. It, it turns out that- It'd be great. It'd be great if we just had that tax though, right? Yeah. 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 And they, they, they had a bunch of other- that tax, they'll never get rid of the others. So No, no. Yeah, they, in these, and obviously in the Nordic countries, they had a lot more on top of that. But- you know, I, I've seen OECD rankings and the U.S. is by far the most progressively taxed system. And I, a lot of people don't realize that when we talk about taxing the rich and fair share and all that. Um, well, and, and they try to tax the middle class through corporate taxation. That's that's why they want to raise corporate taxes. They know that that's just a tax on consumers, I think. I mean, uh, it just sounds good. It's populist, things like that. That's true. What, what's the corporate tax rate in places like the Nordic countries? Um, I think that they're pretty, they're not that high. I mean, I think we had a higher one when we were at 30, whatever oh, it was, 36%. Sure yeah. But now I think we're below them. So I'm not a hundred percent sure, but probably in the high twenties or something. It, it, um, talk about culture and how they di differ from us. Um, again, these are, these are some things I like, uh, you said Nordic mentality, most common in, in Denmark is called the, the law of, how do I say this? Jante? I think so. I yeah. How to pronounce it. <laughs> hey, you wrote it. The set of informal <laughs> social norms says things like, you're not to think you are anything special. You're not to think you're as good as, as, as we are. My exact, maybe we're losing something in translation there, but it, it's this, it, it kind of seems like this sort of, um, you know, everybody should stop complaining. Uh, you shouldn't get your feelings hurt too much. And this sort of allows them to, to have this kind of welfare system that I, that I don't think we, we have here. Um, I don't know. I mean, and maybe, maybe the way I want to simplify that question is like, what are some of the good things that maybe we should strive for if, if we're going to say, if we're going to try and compare ourselves to Nordic countries all the time? <laughs> well, they're quite docile in, in those countries, or I should say that they're met, you know, they're, they're not a diverse people and they just like the government. So, um, but you know, and they're very hardworking. I mean, there's a great work ethic and Scandinavian people, you know, Nordic, nor all Nordic countries is there was a quote I have in the book from Milton Friedman, where, um, an economist says to him, you know, we have no poor people in, in, in Scandinavian countries. And he says, that's great. We have no poor Scandinavians in the United States either. And when you look at our, uh, Scandinavian, you know, people of Scandinavian descent, they actually are, have higher levels of achievement here than they do there, you know, so they're just successful people. And I know, you know, some people get offended when you talk about ethnicities in this way, but there just is a difference between people in Greece and Italy, people in Germany and Scandinavia. It's just, they have different temperaments. Not maybe one's not better than the other. Maybe life in Italy is great and people like it. Um, but the work ethic up there is, is really strong. Hmm. Um, yeah. But I think that we actually have qu quite a bit of that. And they're, they're also pretty entrepreneurial, even though I think the, the you know, the just the, the welfare state kind of tamps down on that. But uh, I might as well just hit on this now. I, I just think that the ma ma main difference with between them and everyone else and us is that we are self-selected risk takers, that uh, we're much more comfortable with failure and risk. And we care more about when you ask Americans, they're much more interested in having the opportunity to do things than safety of a job. And uh, and that really shows in how we dominate in the in 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 
the tech field and in, in science and in, in all these things. I think there's just a spirit here. So when I say that I don't want to be more like Europe, it's not always quantifiable. It's not always about some policy. I just think we'd be a more insipid place, you know, like them. You know, I think we'd be more docile, we'd be more reliant, more dependent on the state, and less uh, move. We'd see less movement. We'd see less innovation. We'd see less of what Amer- what makes America actually different than these places and Europe as a whole. I think that's intuitive, just based on a size argument and the scaling argument, because it seems obvious that if you have a room full of ten people and you create a socialist country out of ten people. Well, you can observe each other. You you can hold each other accountable. This is why a co-op, uh, you know, some hippie co-op that Bernie Sanders joins can work with a couple hundred people because everybody knows one another. And there's sort of there's there's other cultural norms associated with that co-op that allow you to shame each other into productivity. Um, and then but, but what people try to do is take that utopia and scale it up. And you and you can't because, well, guess what? The more people there are, the more you can hide. Um, and it, 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 so it seems intuitive and obvious that in a, a much more culturally diverse place like the United States, uh, that scaling just wouldn't work. Um, and even 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 if we take it for what it is and we don't we still have a higher uh, per capita GDP than most of these or median GDP also than most countries in Europe, other than like Luxembourg and Monaco and things like that, you know, with city states, basically. Um, but let's, I, let's get into that, the, the conversation yeah. about wealth and uh you know, how we're doing. What do our poor, you have some interesting comparisons and, and then on our, our, the poorest people in America, their spending habits uh, are comparable to normal people in many parts of Europe. Yeah. I mean, I, I repeat the stack because I thought it was amazing when I first read it, but Britain, if we conquered them and made them a state, they'd be the second poorest state after Mississippi per capita. I mean, and Britain is a yeah. successful place. So most countries in Europe would be in the bottom third, including Germany. Um, and as I said, only Luxembourg and Monaco, and maybe there's another one would, you know, would rank near the top. So, and obviously Norway does well too, but they're also an oil state, you know, they hand out checks for their oil, from their oil wells, things like that. But just to think of how we scale that to 350 million people is, is, is quite amazing. Now, there is inequality, but I don't care about inequality. I know people get very offended by that, but wealth grows. It's not a pie that we cut up. It's not a zero-sum uh, proposition. And uh, as far as wealth growth, <laughs> growing wealth goes, we dominate by every quantifiable measure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what should matter is if you're going to measure something, quality of life for your poorest individuals, that, that would seem like a, a better measure of the success of a society, society as opposed to how much richer Elon Musk is than me. It just doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter because I'm doing fine. Or how uh, many people, or how many people in your society live above, you know, are, are, are wealthy in essence. And in America, that number is incredibly high by, you know, if we compare ourselves to other nations. How, how much did you dig into that? Because that, that's kind of a fascinating stat that the uk would be the second poorest state it, it, that, cap, I, think, I, I think per capita so so what accounts for that is there um are, are the rich just not that rich in in the uk is is, is this something you really dug into or yeah I mean, it, it I, just I seems so counterintuitive yeah, yeah, I didn't dig into that particular stat as much as just in general. We are much richer in, in our consumption. But, by, you know, the take people who visit Europe usually go to tourist spots and, and it's really beautiful. But if you live there for any amount of time, you will notice that your life is a little different there. It's not you don't have access to as many things as easily as you do here, things you don't even think about. But I'll give you one quick example. And I, I think I might be off a little on the numbers, but it's around this A house in the United States, I think, is around a thousand square feet on average, bigger than a house in Europe. Now, <laughs> the liberals will say, do you need a 3,000 square foot house? And I say, yeah, I actually quite, well, I want one. And so I want it, right? We don't need anything, but um, we have cars. If you go out into the suburbs in any major American city, you're going to see houses that will be man- that are, are mm-hmm. equivalent of mansions in Europe. Yeah, um, that's true. And all of that. So it, it's, and, right, and, it's not and, always and from, quantifiable, from my, but it's there. From my personal anecdote, Let's look at Copenhagen, for instance. Um, beautiful tourist center. It seems seems like just heaven on earth, right? It's so cool. Uh, but you go 15, 20 minutes outside of that, and it feels pretty desolate. It, 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 as, a, as as compared to an American suburb, I would mean. Like it, it's not it's not Somalia. 
uh, by, by any stretch, yeah, yeah. right? It's still Denmark, but oh, yeah. it's um, it doesn't have the life, the the, the buzz to it. You certainly can't. It's, it's unclear where you would buy things uh, that you want. To, to to your point about just getting stuff, which you know, for better or worse, is important to Americans. We're big consumers. Uh, we consume a lot more, spend a lot more than Europeans, and uh, like it, it, it. Maybe that works for them. But I, I think that the point of this is, would it work for us? Would it make Americans happy? And I think the answer is probably not. Yeah, I mean, for a lot of Europhiles in this country, they want to stick people in urban areas, have them live in smaller apartments, you know, use mass transit, things like that. Listen, I, I grew up in New York. I get that. But I also then moved to Colorado and I get that people want their cars and they do not want to be on a train forever. Right. Um, so I think that. You know, the, just the lifestyle is different. Once you get out of cities uh, in Europe, yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot of poverty. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're going to ask me about immigration. A lot of that, you know, there are basically ghettos outside of cities that would, you know, horrify people here who, you know, who are in the Acela corridor, you know, talking about Baltimore or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of that going on in Europe as well. Yeah, I do want to get to the immigration and diversity conversation. Um, I really just want to state this other uh, citation you have, which is interesting and sort of gets to maybe maybe why we build wealth better. There's a mentality difference. And I've seen other uh, stats that have similar questions to this uh, and come up with similar answers. But according to World Values Survey, 70 percent of Americans believe that the poor can escape poverty if they work hard enough. Okay, simple enough statement. But 35 percent of Europeans share that view. I mean, I'd love to dig into that more. I don't know why only 35 percent. That seems insane i'll tell you why you know why because it's true (laughs) there's much much more class movement here because there is much more um it's the risk that basically progressives mostly but you know populists sometimes just want to take away and the creative destruction that goes into it and there's always a downside in american society because of how you know capitalistic we are that there are certain people are going to suffer because of technological advances and things like that i don't want them to suffer we should try to help reorient them but trying to sort of this cronyism that preserves dying industries for instance i think it keeps people in uh it it doesn't allow for as much class movement and in europe people as i said are much more interested polls show this much much more interested in having a secure job than they are in being uh, having the ability to to try something new or to open a business failure here is part of every um Every great part story of the American dream. Sense. Yeah, exactly. If, if you didn't, I think sometimes people make up fail. Like politicians will sometimes be, you know, pretend they like had these great failures, which they didn't even have, you know, or like it's part of the mythology of the American right. life is that you got to fall down a few times before you succeed. I don't think that they have a similar kind of ideal in Europe. Um, even now, like we have bankruptcy laws that let you go on with your life after you could be successful. You could become president after a few bankruptcies even. But um in, in Europe, they're actually looking to American bankruptcy laws because it's it's so debilitating there, you know, for a person to, to get out of that, that uh, they're actually looking here. So that's just part of the sort of cultural personality, I think, that makes us different. R- related to wealth and then related to the diversity conversation I want to have is uh, a study you note that found that Europe had the lowest female involvement in entrepreneurial activity of any region in the world and the lowest gender parity. Any region in the world? And the lowest gender parity, uh, as opposed to the U.S., where 35 percent of American entrepreneurs are, are female, we're by far number one. You say that's 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 incredible. Nobody ever talks about that. Yeah, I mean, top thir- you know, just aside from that, top 30 tech companies in the wor- world. Only one is European. Now, I just want to—I don't know if people realize there are more people in Europe than the United States, right? You're talking about a lot of wealth and a lot of different cultures, and they just cannot—they just do not create now to be fair to them a lot of their brightest come here because they can make a lot more money and there's a lot more opportunity here right but uh that i think speaks well of us as well when you if you look at all these top tech companies they're either like immigrants or first generation americans like over and over um and there's a reason for that even with doctors by the way they make a lot more money here and they all doctors a lot of great doctors to this country because there's just more opportunity so we're always bashing you know the rich but being rich is also something the poor look, you know, having a lot of rich people is also something the poor look to, to as, a, as something they can achieve, not, you know, something as a barrier as they do in Europe quite often. 
Well, let's talk about the the, the myths. Like the, the left thinks we're just the most racist place that's ever existed. Uh, we created racism. It's born into us. It's uh, we're terrible. We're mean to immigrants. It's just awful. Everything's awful. Uh, but those Europeans, boy, they're just so enlightened. Uh, how, how would you answer that charge? Now, people mock me when I say this, and 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 you know, I get a lot of angry mail. But we are the least racist place on earth, probably. I don't. I mean that in a practical way. I'm not saying that no one ever. I grew up in a neighborhood where, where mostly Irish and Italians and Jews, and we all hated each other pretty much. But we also dated each other, started businesses together, went to the same schools, and in any kind of real way. We got along. That matters, doesn't everybody right? in New York hate each other, though? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but the point part is, of being in New York. even now in D.C., I live near people who would be killing each other elsewhere, Pakistanis and Indians, etc. You know, it, it is is my it is it is the great it is a miracle of human history that we can do this here. I I I I don't know how to stress it more than that. People in in Europe they can't even integrate single minorities into countries properly. They don't assimilate. There's a lot of hatred there. Sometimes it's not, you know, sometimes it's bubbling underneath. But, you know, my parents came from Hungary, which is basically only Hungarians lived there and gypsies. And basically they hated the gypsies and Jews, right? Like they could not integrate them into society for for long periods of time. Uh, This happens in European countries. It's happening today. And for anyone to think that this is the most (laughs) racist country in the world, they just have no context of the world or history or anything like that. It, this hasn't been brought up in a while, but the, um, the, the, the Muslim population in Europe, you know, we, we just don't have those. I don't feel like we have those same problems in America. It's not like we, we don't have a large Muslim populations. I'm from Houston. We have enormous Muslim populations. I, I don't, I'm not aware of any rifts. I'm not aware of any problems. There's real problems in the UK, uh, not just the UK, throughout Europe. Um, enclaves of Sharia law. Last time I was in the UK, 2004 and i recall in germany as well uh more recently in germany but i i I recall being in some areas of town uh where i was i was clearly not welcome (laughs) and i needed to go uh and obviously that happens in america too but for totally different reasons um you know it's just that's more of a crime issue than, than anything else but it was uh it was it was it was strange um how how has that evolved over time well, Muslim Americans are, are incredibly successful. You know, they, you know, it depends where in the world they're from, but they may, they, they are financially very successful people, very assimilated people for the most part. And, and that's because that's what we do. We've been doing it for a long time with many different populations. And uh, in Europe is the opposite because for num- numerous reasons, but there are generational ghettos in Germany where Turkish immigrants came and, you know, in the 50s and 60s, and they're still, you know, having trouble assimilating still high, high levels on, of, of unemployment and lack of education and things of that nature. In France, same thing from northern Africa. We don't really have that those kind of places here. Yeah, we are, our first generation is usually very assimilated. And uh, it's because, you know, a lot of people say diversity is our strength. I think it's our strength is that we have a lot of diverse people who accept the same norms of society, yeah, the freedoms yeah. that others can live under this. You can keep part of your culture, but there's something you have to give up to allow others to live their lives as well. And in Europe, you have a really large population coming in at the same time, which happened a few years ago, and they're not assimilating and they, and they have an illiberal philosophy sometimes of governing. And that is a big problem if you're not going to make cultural demands of people to assimilate. And some of it's structural where you put them in these cities where they're not integrating because they don't really can't, you know, there's no jobs for them. There's no, they don't befriend the people of the nation, et cetera. And uh, they're compartmentalized. So that's, you know, that's just some of the reasoning, but it's, it's a dangerous situation, I think in the long run where we don't really have that. I'm just talking about regular immigration. I think when you have illegal immigration, you have similar problems because you have these immigrants uh, who are living in the shadows, et cetera. It, it, but that's bad for them because they don't get to integrate. They don't get to become part of society. We should want, you know, that's just anarchy on the southern border. I'm for a lot of immigration, but there needs to be some sort of, uh, you know, obviously some system where we can make these people Americans. You also point out that they're just less tolerant culturally. I can't find the stat, but I, I remember reading it and it was, um, an average of about 30% of Europeans across, across the different European countries, 
about 30, 35% will say diversity makes them stronger. Um, in America, 60% apparently say that. It doesn't mean we want more immigrants because I see other stats, you know, so I'll balance this comment with a, the other stat I'll, I'll look at is only about 35% of Americans say they want more immigration. Um, another 35% say it's good about where it is. Only about 30% say they want a little less. But um, there, but there's at least this value, of this this idea that we do value diversity, that we believe in this melting pot theory. Now, melting pot, not a salad bowl. Uh, and this is where the right disagrees with the left in this country. But it, that, that probably would shock most Americans, too, to see Europeans answer those questions that way. Yeah, there, there are there are polls that dig deeper. Like they ask you, would you want to live next to someone you know who wasn't like you? And astonishingly high numbers of Europeans say no. <laughs> like twenty seven percent of French, I think it was something like that. Yeah. Um, and part that of it is driven me. because there are real cultural, you know, there are real cultural flashpoints and things like that. You know, you can ask Jewish people in, in Paris, for instance, how 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 things are going. So. Um, that's a problem. It, I was, you know, I think it's actually eighty percent of Americans say, you know, they they think having other kinds of people around them is good. What I forgot how they uh, framed the question, but even if they don't believe it, even if they're racists inside or bigots inside, they know to say it, which says something about the country <laughs> yes. as well, right? They and it also probably it, it also probably it. affects their behavior. This gets to a whole other conversation about right, CRT right, right. and unconscious bias and how it's, you know, even if you're unconsciously biased, it doesn't doesn't actually affect behavior in America. That's also the right. other side of the coin. They don't talk it, about very yeah, often. Yeah, I hate when people lump in like someone saying something, saying something and someone systemically not allowing someone to achieve or, or, or keeping them out, out of their business, which rarely ever happens in this country. There's a big difference between those things. Um, obviously, there are residual hatreds that come from the old world or whatever. As I said, you know, I have Pakistani and Indian neighbors. I'm sure that it's not easy always to be right near each other, but they give that up after the first generation, second generation. I think it's important. Um, but yeah, I mean, we know we're supposed to live with other people and uh, and we have a lot of choices on where we can live. In Europe, these things don't exist. People don't move as much. You know, you live and, and you have a, another compartmentalized group right next to you. And, and it causes a lot of friction because you're living next to each other. You're not living with each other. And I think that's a big difference. Uh, this inability to integrate immigrants, you know, leads to these divisions, um, leads to radicalism that percolates throughout these immigrant communities. Uh, you noted there's 85 Sharia courts throughout Europe right now, um, 25 neighborhoods in the UK where they think um, extremism is percolating. So, and this and this in turn leads to this um, right wing backlash, which is in, in Europe is sort of ethno nationalist in, in nature. Um, this leads me to a, a question. I, I didn't talk about it a lot in the book, but it's a question uh, or a topic I like to discuss and at least expose to the left because we're not the same. The right on the view in the United States is not the same as the right in, in Europe. Um, what do you have to say about the difference between the two dispositions, you know, these conflicts of vision, as Thomas Sowell puts it, the left and the right in Europe? What do we have in common with that, with that right wing? What, what don't we? Well, I would say that the American right, at least uh, until recently, it's more a, a, what you'd call a classical liberal or what maybe a, a European would call a classical liberal or a, just a liberal um, a person. You know, it's much more ideological where I think uh, in, in Europe, you rarely have that kind of ideological separation, even in Britain. Basically, you have one government who wants to use the state in one way. And I mean, one party and another party wants to use the state in maybe a more socialistic way. Um, and yeah, the right there is ethno nationalistic or, you know, fascistic or, you know, here there that exists, but it's really a small group, which is why the media have to pretend all like, you know, give them this outsized coverage all the time to pretend that there's some big movement. There isn't a single ethno nationalist elected in, in the United States national government, probably not even on the state level. Maybe there's one or two here or there um, in Europe. It'd be, it'd be political there. suicide. Exactly. Exactly. In Europe, that's not really the case. You have very strongly ethno-nationalistic movements in Eastern Europe and in France, even and places like in Germany a little bit. 
Um, and it's kind of dangerous. But that's not the right wing in the United States. This is why I never understand when they call me a fascist. It's like I want government out of, <laughs> of my life. I want government and, and business to decouple, which is why I want deregulation. So they can't, you know, uh, so government can't pressure businesses to do things. And yet, uh, you, you know, you'll be called a fascist, whatever, you know, it is what it is. But uh, it's definitely not the same in Europe. There is no you, I guess a Republican there, a cons- small government conservative, just be considered some kind of oddity, uh, uh, a libertarian, yeah. really. But, you know, yeah, and the libertarian does, there would just be an anarchist, I guess. Yeah, it does, it does kind of seem that way. I mean, I've talked with some you know, folks in the, the United Kingdom government, and they're very clearly conservatives, as I would as I would label them. But they're just powerless. You know, <laughs> they don't, they don't yeah. have a lot of... Uh, you know, they're just they're they're going along to get along, doing the best they well, can. Well, I think once the state is as big as it is in most European countries, bureaucracy wise, and, and, and you know this, you know, it's very difficult to roll back. This is why, you know, when Biden wants to pass a three point five trillion dollar expansion of the welfare state, that's a forever bill. You could say three point five, five point five, but it's going to go on. It's the, the New Deal the great society, these things are almost never rolled back. And uh, it's just too difficult. People become dependent on the state. And, you know, this is why this is my, you know, basically what I try to warn warn in the book. A couple other topics I think are interesting. Let's talk abortion um, or sanctity of life in general. But it is interesting on the abortion conversation, and this is uh, what pro-life people who want to argue for the pro-life position should should know quite a bit, is that compared to the U.S., European abortion laws definitely protect life a heck of a lot more than ours do uh, in the aggregate, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, mm-hmm. Only recently, have, as many Republican states really started passing stricter abortion laws, and then, of course, they just get struck down. Um, but, but 12 weeks is, I think the average there, 12 week limits. Yep. Um, and it's very difficult to get one after that. And I, I'll never forget this in, um, grad school, I was at Harvard, very diverse because we like diversity. And, um, one of my classmates, she's French. Um, and every international student, um, that comes to a place like Harvard or to any American grad school. They automatically think that they're Democrats. They don't really know why, and they're not really partisans. Um, they're frankly very open-minded and they're enjoyable to, to talk to. But um, they definitely think that they're liberal leaning and Democrats. And frankly, they, they mostly are. But I'll never, and, and, this, and this particular classmate, she was, she's extremely liberal. But when I told her what abortion laws were in this country, for the most part, she was just shocked. You know, I was just absolutely shocked. Um, and she's like, that's barbaric. That's a baby. You're talking about baby. You're just killing babies at this point. And I said, yes, yes, that, that is the point. Now, but on the other yeah, hand, you, you, you point out some other uh, bad, you know, worse things they do. They don't even consider one of the reasons they have a lower infant mortality rate is because they don't even count the baby as living past a certain point. And so so how, how should we really view their 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 views on this? I was actually quite perplexed by abortion laws considering the attitude in Europe, um, you know, and why they're stricter than here. And I don't remember, I wish I could credit the person who told me this, but I think this it makes sense to me is that there is really no pro-life movement in Europe. There's no anti-abortion movement. I think that the anti-abortion movement has driven the pro-abortion movement to extreme. So in the sense of, uh, you know, it's in the nineties when I was younger, you know, you have safe, rare and, you know, uh, legal. Right. And now you have people wearing shirts celebrating abortion. You basically have abortion defended till crowning and, you know, 10,000, whatever the number is, completely viable babies are, are destroyed every year. And this is defended all the time, though. You know, when you look at polls, you know, uh, people don't support that more, pe- you know, I, it's, it's much more complicated than the media leads on. Um, but in Europe, there's really no there's no anti-abortion movement. So it's just sort of settled into a reasonable place, at least in the minds of people who are, mo- you know, in the middle of this issue. I don't like the word moderate. I don't think there's any moderate about abortion, but you know what I mean? So um, it depends which country. But there is no pro-life movement. Uh, you know, it's it's like with, you know, euthanasia there you know it's essentially done in many some countries far more openly than others have rule laws that allow it for any reason you want some countries and uh there's hardly any movement against it you know the people who are against it are seen as sort of religious fanatics 
which it, you know, which is how they see us as slack jawed religious fanatics with guns, which is true, but in a good way. And <laughs> there it is, you know, it is not. So um, that might be an explanation for why abortion laws are, 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 are stricter there. And it might be residual as well, because you we had a lot of Catholic countries and a lot of, you know, the, the thing that people don't realize in Europe, the it, it, in Europe, the state and, and the church are very tied together. In Sweden, until very recently, I think the church was funded by the government. So you have no religious competition either. You just have this, you know, just dying because less and less people are religious there. And you just have these dying institutions connected to the state. There's no uh, it, there's a marketplace of ideas here in faith as well that push people towards different ideas about abortion and, and otherwise, you know, other issues as well. So you'd have none of that in Europe. It's when I say dying, I, I mean it. They don't have kids. They don't protect life in the same way. They do abortion. But I just don't think that that is um, I just think that's because this stasis there in a way. Um, but, you know, so. I think it, it, does, it does. It does seem to me it's not just abortion. It does seem to me that our American left wing is more extreme than their left wing. And, and maybe that's precisely because they don't have any competition. And and that competition that's so it's so 50 50 here, um, it fosters a, a little bit yeah. of extremism, which I think on the right, we're we're lucky in a sense, because our, our entire philosophy is about limiting principles. You can't go outside the box too much. Uh, but on the left, it's, it's that's not it at all. It's it's progressivism, which means you can progress to any level. You know, you can progress to utopia, which means there is no box, there is no window. Yeah. That you know. And, I mean, like take take wokeism. I I don't Europe. There is no real movement. No, they like, hate it, right? They yeah, they, they think it's ridiculous. It, you know, so that yeah. Listen. So that, I, well, let's I, talk about some good things then about yeah. about Europe. You know, because I mean, I don't think there's a lot in your book because it's called Euro Trash. But <laughs> so clearly, it wasn't meant to, you know, be a well. On the one hand, this, but on the other hand, this. But come on, I mean, there's got to be some good things that um, that maybe we should look to the across the pond uh, and, and maybe things we could emulate and, and work for here. Got to be something. Not many. There was uh, <laughs> in Germany and in France. <laughs> You know, a, a nuclear energy program that was really yeah. successful. Yeah. Well, Fran helps, Francis, uh, Francis said they're going to start that back up again. Yeah. Um, and the UK but, as know, well. Oh, we didn't talk about energy. Now they're, now they're, really now they're bringing in Russian, Russian yeah. fuel. So, like, that's one of the things. Gun violence, as I mentioned, uh, was another. Um, but I, I don't think they're. But, but they have. But they have crazy amounts of petty crime. I've been robbed. I mean, <laughs> I've not been to Europe very often. Every time I've ever been robbed in my life has been in Europe. <laughs> like I yeah. just, I've had things stolen. I've chased people down just because, you know, I was, I, 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 my, my time in Europe is as a, as a teenager, basically going backpacking and things. And I mean, it's, it's, it just doesn't happen here the way it does. No, and plus you don't want to give those people guns over there because every few years they'll just have a world war. So the key there is to limit weaponry, but here, you know, we're, we're mostly responsible, but in some places we're not. So yeah. we, we definitely have more homicides. Um, but I mean, it's really a quite, I mean, listen, Germans are, are really industrious people. You could see the cars they make, right? I mean, they yeah, do a yeah, great job, obviously. whatever they do. But, um, but I think that we, this is going to sound so terrible. I think we took the best of them, right? I mean, we, we took the best of everyone and we let them shine here. People who come, there is not a single ethnic minority or ethnicity that you can mention that doesn't do better here than they do in their homeland or did in their homeland. Not one, That's a great point. not the Japanese, not the Germans, not the Scandinavians. So, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a partisan as it is for America, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I think Europe's a wonderful place. God, I love European history. I love talking about it. Our best ideas came from there. Christianity, the, the idea of free choice, uh, I mean, free will, the idea of classical liberal ideas of free speech. Mm -hmm. All that, a lot of that comes from Britain, right? They and, just want to uh, preserve that's great. Yeah. And but now <laughs> I, I, mean, I got, I have to add to this. Like I said, I was, I've been robbed at least three times in Europe. I lived in Bogota, Colombia for four years. <laughs> and I was out all the time and I was never robbed once. Let me just put that in perspective for people. <laughs> okay. It's nuts. Anyway, I just had to point that out. Go ahead. What was I didn't mean to interrupt? All right, let me say one quick thing now that you mentioned Bogota, but like, you know, people always say to me, well, America has the geographical advantage of being, you know, that's why I can do all these things. But, you know, there are a lot of other countries with geographical advantages. Take Brazil, right? Um, they are a country with a similar population, similar size, lots of natural resources. They are not as successful, not even close, nor is Argentina, nor is any, anyone, um, nor is Canada, frankly. I mean, Canada does very well, but I always feel like they're just kind of uh, leeches on our success. But, you know, so um, 
the idea that we're only success Russia, Russia is huge space, natural resources, all kinds of things, and they're not as successful either. There's something more to it. And I, don't, I think that uh, the American left doesn't want to accept that the way they talk about us, you know, as we're as, as, as if we're, you know, one of the worst places on Earth. Yeah, I, I would like you to, to do another book similar to this on China, China trash, uh, because <laughs> it really to help people understand what they're maybe uh, uh, I think I think we need as, as we analyze the China problem over the next well, for the foreseeable future, really, uh, we need an honest conversation about what they're really good at, but also what they're really bad at. And then how to expose those weaknesses should we need to? I mean, their aging problem in mean, Europe, the whole world has an aging problem, but Europe has a really bad one. Japan has an extremely bad one. China has an extremely mm -hmm. bad one. You know, their their high debt, their wasted investments. I mean, there's just um, and I, and I wonder when the lack of freedom uh, in China that that sort of boot on the neck of the citizen in China, that fear based uh, governance. I wonder when it comes back to bite them. You know. Um, because even, again, you want to talk about the American left glorifying certain cultures. They, they love to glorify the Chinese too. They can't seem to say anything bad about them. It's very, very odd. Um, yeah. I don't get it. But so uh, It's just the most nefarious regime that's ever existed, meaning going back, all the way back to its beginning. It's killed more people than anyone. It's just treated human beings as slaves, not just in camps, but just in, in you know, for, for years and years. And it is horrifying. And I think that the Chinese people freed of that. You think about Taiwan or Singapore and see what kind of things they can do. Um, it would be an, an, it would be great for the world. It would be the, one of the greatest things that ever happened to the world. But, uh, I used to think that it would turn when capitalism was started up there in certain ways. I thought, you know, it would be like Eastern Europe, you know, it would be like the wall falling and all of that. But it's not happened. And it, it's worrisome because now they have basically a kind of a fascist state going there, which is sort of collectivist, but also, you know, has these big business ventures that they control. And uh, I'm, a, you know, it's, it's, it's nerve wracking. I'm not sure what to do about it. <laughs> like, I have no real I mean, we don't want any kind of war obviously i don't you know i don't think that they you know trade barriers will help because you know it's not like mao's china was any better just because they weren't trading it was actually quite worse so i don't know i don't know have real good answers for that one but they are just uh, just a terrible that regime is just horrifying well maybe it gets to you know focusing on our strengths as a way to compete with them and so that we don't have to worry about them and uh and so maybe we could end with that a conversation on the future of america uh, as we record this, I'm not sure when we're posting this, but as we record it, Virginia, the Virginia election was yesterday and everybody was pretty excited about that one. Um, I think the only one that's still in question is the AG race, but Glenn Youngkin looks like he's going to be governor. You got your first black uh, uh, lieutenant governor and uh, you know, win some Sears. And it's just an awesome night. New Jersey <laughs> almost flipped, which is insane. Absolutely insane. And uh, it looks like there's a backlash in America uh, against wokeism, against progressive policies. But um, but the Democrats probably will. They will pass something. They will pass something. And if anything, they're doubling down. Um, this has been the conversation on the Hill all day. Is Has this changed? Has this changed anything Democrats are doing or saying? And the answer is no. I think everybody's kind of still in their same positions. This really changed nothing for them. Um, because just like on the right, the left will say, well, it's because we weren't left wing enough. And the moderates will say, no, you're driving people crazy. And we have the exact same conversation on the right. Um, and I, God, I hope we don't act like them when we take the majority, but shall see. So, um, what are you, what are you optimistic about in this country? Uh, can, can we sustain four years of Bidenism, um, and, and his extreme lurch to the left? Because this was not what we expected from them. Well, I'd just quickly say, I think the Democrats will pass something as well, because for them, as it was with Obamacare, when they, I think, knew they were going to really have to pay a price, it, the incrementalism is worth it for them. I think every step forward is worth it for, you know, especially the progressives who don't worry about their seats, you know, in urban areas or, you know, in, in very high, high wealth areas where, where, their, where their ideas are popular. But I was also excited about Virginia, not because Republicans won necessarily, because the plenty of Republicans do things I don't like, but because it was about pushing back against, it was about school choice. It was about caring, you know, is about pushing back against teachers unions and administrations that strip people, parents of power over their own children and want to teach them, you know, this historical fiction about the United States and want to force the very just authoritarian kind of things where the governor or the candidate for governor says parents shouldn't have a say basically in their, you know, curriculum. So, 
because of why it wasn't just, oh, you know, we hate Democrats. It was about like these ideas that I think are important. School choice, I think, is an issue for Republicans that is could be hugely advantageous moving forward and, and really hope they push it. Um, so I was excited about that. And it's always nice to see the folks at MSNBC and CNN freak out. It's the most entertaining TV there is when, uh, you know, Democrats lose. But um, it's weird how moderates will keep losing and it only kind of strengthens the progressive wing of that party so that that like, you know, it was like Obamacare. There used to be a ton of blue dog Democrats and a lot of moderates and they all lost because of Obamacare, even though it wasn't really that they were pushing it. And now you have the same thing happening with this welfare state expansion. So um, that concerns me a bit where you're going to have a party that's really just radicalized. Um, But we'll see. I mean, if they lose and shrink, maybe it'll change. I, I do think we're we're running into a situation where we sort of solidify this uh, hyper hyper leftist base in the Democrat Party. I hope it doesn't happen to us. I don't think it will, for the reasons I stated earlier, because conservatism, as long as we as long as we maintain the mantra that conservatism must remain about principles, and um, you know, because the, the left will accuse us of being this cult of Donald Trump and. Look, obviously, there's there's some people who, who clearly engage in that, right? He can do no wrong. They love him. I say, look, he's not Jesus. He's not the devil, but he is a guy who pretty much governed on on basic Republican conservative principles. He was not. There is no there is no like Trump agenda that's very different from the Republican agenda. He was just super bold about it. Um, you know, it, you, we can quibble with that on the margins, but for the most part, that's true. So I'm not as uh, pessimistic about our side. Um, but we do have a tendency to get a little too, you know, wild with our rhetoric and, and turn off moderates. And that was very clearly what happened in the 2020 election with suburbanites. I've, I've long said this. I said we never lost those suburbanites. We never lost the suburban moms. Um, they just they, they hated Trump. You know, I think it's irrational how much they hated him, but they did. Uh, but we didn't lose them. And I, I love this race in Virginia because it's, it's really it's proof of that. Yeah. I mean, there are two things going on now that are very tangible issues for people. A lot of these debates, I care about them, but they're theoretical. It's not something that affects your life right away. They're ideological, but uh, um, your school, your kids, that's something you really care about. You sacrifice a lot typically to send your kids or live in a good district, all of that. And then just to see what's going on must be horrifying for parents. And the other thing is just watching the price of stuff go up when you go to the supermarket. Inflation is a really scary thing for a lot of Americans. It's a wealth destroying uh, tax on Americans. And um, I think that those two things are are most dangerous for, for Democrats right now. Also dangerous for America, unfortunately. So I'd like to see them stop what they're doing or do something better sooner than later. So we'll mm-hmm. see about that. David, thanks for being on. I got to go vote. Yeah, vote the right way. Make sure. <laughs> I'll be careful. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for coming on again. Bye. Appreciate it.